Hello and welcome to another tutorial. I wanted to take a bit of a different approach today and talk about an accounting topic, something that comes up often in interviews, the concept of deferred revenue. I'm going to show you how it works with common interview questions and then how it works in real life and how it can get quite a bit more complicated than how textbooks normally present this. So deferred revenue is quite straightforward. If you look at accounting textbooks, Investopedia, accountingcoach.com, other sites like that, and they're not necessarily wrong, but in real life, it is not so easy because of the fact that many companies have subscription services and have multi-pay contracts and other things like that that make the mechanics more complicated. If you want all the files and resources for this lesson, you can go to our accounting knowledge base page and then deferred revenue. As always, I'll pin this comment below the video as the first comment, so you can click on it right there. By popular demand, we have also brought back the three statement interview question model that we used to offer. Now, it is a simplified version, so it doesn't have everything on it, but it should still be useful for interview questions and lots of practice with the most common live items. So you'll be able to get that there by following that link. Here's the short version of deferred revenue. Deferred revenue is used for payments the company has received for products and services it has not yet delivered. So if you wanna pretend you're a consultant for a minute and think about this in terms of a two by two matrix, you can have cash collected or paid up front at the top, and then on the side, you can have whether or not the product or service has been delivered. And then in the middle, here's what the quadrants look like. When you have no for both of these or yes for both of these, you don't really need anything because there are no timing differences in these cases. The timing differences really emerge when you have cash that has been collected or paid, but the product or service has not yet been delivered, or when it's the opposite, when the product or service has been delivered, but there has not been a cash collection or payment. So in that category are items like accounts receivable, accounts payable, accrued expenses. These all represent cases of some type of delivery without paying for it or receiving the cash. And then the opposite end, you have items like prepaid expenses, deferred revenue, and inventory, which represent cases where their cash payment has been made, but there hasn't been a delivery of the product or service. Now, I have added some stars and footnotes here because technically speaking, accounts receivable and accounts payable are supposed to correspond to invoices, not delivery. But in simple scenarios, people normally consider invoices and delivery to be about the same. And then for deferred revenue, as you'll see, this one has a double star because the cash treatment here can vary a little bit, and it's not always for cases where the entire cash balance has been collected or paid up front. So let's look at a very simple example here of selling a product for $100, getting cash, and then not delivering it to the customer yet. So I'm gonna pull up our accounting three statement model right here, and so here's what happens. Let's say that deferred revenue increases by 100. When this happens, nothing changes on the income statement because there's been no delivery yet. We've just gotten a cash payment from a customer. On the cash flow statement, you will see a positive entry for the change in deferred revenue because this makes our cash balance go up. So it was 400 before, now it's 500. And so on the balance sheet, cash is up. It was 400, now it's 500. And so the asset side is up by 100. And then on the other side, deferred revenue under liabilities and equity is up by 100. So both sides of the balance sheet balance, they're both up by 100. Now in the next step of this process, we recognize this as 100 in actual revenue because we now deliver the product or service to the customer. So if I say that deferred revenue decreases by 100, now on the income statement, our revenue is up by 100. We're assuming no expenses at this stage. So our pre-tax income is up by 100. And at a 25% tax rate, our net income is up by 75. On the cash flow statement, the net income is up by 75. That previous increase in deferred revenue cancels out because now it's decreasing. It's going back to its original level. So this is just zero. And then at the bottom, our cash balance is up by 75 due to the net income increase. On the balance sheet, our cash is up by 75. And then our equity is up by 75 because the net income has increased. The intuition here is simply that we've sold a product for 100. We haven't had any expenses associated with it. We've paid 25 in taxes. And so our cash is up by 75. So that's a very simple case, but also a pretty common interview question. And I've just summarized the steps right here. Now, in a subscription context, this gets more complicated because the delivery is not necessarily a one-time thing. So it might take place continually, or it might take place many times or multiple times over the course of a month, a quarter, a year, or something like that. In a subscription context, deferred revenue typically corresponds to invoices and billing dates. And if a customer does not pay in cash upfront for an entire contract, then accounts receivable 
on the asset side and deferred revenue on the liabilities and equity side both increase at the same time and offset each other so that the balance sheet remains in balance. When the cash is actually collected, accounts receivable falls to reflect that, and then deferred revenue keeps falling over time as more and more revenue is recognized as the product or service is delivered, whether it takes weeks or months or quarters or years. That's the short version. Let's go into some more complex examples now. So first I'll show you what happens when you have deferred revenue with associated delivery expenses. Then we'll talk about why deferred revenue is a liability. And then we'll talk about deferred revenue in the context of SaaS accounting, which is a topic we've already covered, but I think it is worth reviewing and bringing up here again, just to summarize the main points. So one common question we get is that this scenario with deferred revenue is unrealistic because it always costs something to deliver a product or service. Even if it's a digital product, you're probably gonna have at least some small expenses associated with it. So if you want to model associated expenses, in the initial step, deferred revenue and cash are both still going to be up by 100. So let's go back and I'm gonna delete the decreases by 100 for now. So in step one, nothing really changes. Cash and deferred revenue are up by 100. In step two, we'll say that 100 of revenue gets recognized, but now we have 20 in associated expenses. So maybe these are payment processing or support or bandwidth or infrastructure costs or something like that if it's a digital product or service. So I'm gonna say that deferred revenue decreases by 100. And then I'm also gonna have a cost of services here and say that this increases by 20. Now, normally we use this line item for COGS, but here I've relabeled it to cost of services or COGS because it could correspond to either one in this model. So as a result of this, 100 of extra revenue, 20 in extra expenses, our pre-tax income is now up by 80 rather than 100, and so our net income is up by 60 rather than 80. On the cash flow statement, our net income is up by 60 rather than 80, and so our cash at the bottom is up by 60. And on the balance sheet, cash is up by 60, so total assets are up by 60. And on the other side, equity is up by 60 because of the increased net income. So the intuition here is pretty simple, which is that we've sold a product, we've had some expenses, and we've paid taxes on the pre-tax profits from this. And so our cash is up by 60 rather than the 100 selling price of the product or service. So that's how it works. Now it can get more complicated if you have some type of accrued expenses or delivery costs associated with it, but this is a very simple way to think about it. One question we often get about deferred revenue is why it is a liability in the first place. Because students will often say, Deferred revenue seems good because it means we earn more revenue in the future. So why is it a liability? Don't liabilities cost us something? And the answer is that liabilities represent future obligations or cash outflows as we covered in the tutorial last year about the balance sheet overview. So deferred revenue means that the company will incur future costs since it now has a delivery obligation to a customer. You can think of it like this. The company has already collected the cash. That's the good part but now it needs to pay to deliver the product or service, which is the bad part or the part that's going to cost something. And even if there are no delivery expenses, there are going to be taxes. Remember what you saw here, even when there are no delivery expenses, as a result of this deferred revenue, the company now has a tax payment that is 25 higher. So even without that, you still see an impact from this and you still see why it is considered a liability. Now, a related line item is accrued revenue, which is the opposite of deferred revenue. And this counts as an asset because it means the company has delivered a product or service, but not yet received the cash payment for it. It is very similar to accounts receivable, but the difference is that accounts receivable is typically for items that have a specific invoice attached and AR is based on this invoice, not strictly delivery, which is why I made the footnote in that two by two matrix before, whereas accrued revenue doesn't have this attached. This is more for cases where there has been some type of delivery or it's some type of continual delivery over time without a strict invoice. And the company wants to record that process as it's taking place. But the basic idea is the same, especially if you assume that the invoice date and the delivery date are the same. So let's talk about part three now, deferred revenue in the context of SaaS accounting. So to show you how this works, let's say that an enterprise software company has contracts for $120 per year, they bill every six months, so twice per year, and then the payment for each invoice is due within 90 days, so it is a net 90 setup. If you go over to our SaaS accounting file, you can see this very scenario. So in January of the year, the first thing that happens is that on January 1st, 
if the contract is signed on that date, they will have 60 in billings because that's what the invoice amount is. Deferred revenue and accounts receivable will both initially go up by 60. You see 50 here because this is the end of January, but if you go to January 1st rather than January 31st, these will both be up by 60. Now, after a month passes, so January, let's say, there will be 10 in recognized revenue. Deferred revenue will go down from 60 to 50. And then each month after that, you get 10 more in revenue recognition. AR does not change because there has been no cash collection yet. By the end of March, this is still outstanding, but then sometime between the end of March and the end of April, following that net 90 convention, the cash is collected and the AR goes to zero. Meanwhile, the deferred revenue keeps decreasing by 10 as the 10 in revenue is recognized in each month here. And then of course, when the next invoice is issued on July 1st, let's say, then deferred revenue immediately goes up to 60, 10 in revenue gets recognized that month. So DR goes down to 50 by the end of the month. AR is 60 and it stays at 60 until the cash is actually collected right here. So this is how it works in a subscription software context. And I've just summarized some of the steps down here for your reference on the slides. If you take this in the context of a three statement model, let's say that a company has a 12 month contract for $1,200 and they have invoices every four months and net 60 terms. So the payment is due within about two months. When the company issues an invoice in January, both accounts receivable and deferred revenue should increase by 400. So I'll go to the SAS accounting file and go to the other tab right over here. And you can see what happens. So if we go to month zero, which is January, the AR is 400 and the DR, the deferred revenue is 400 right here. Now, after that, on the monthly income statement, 100 in revenue will be recognized each month. And as you can see here, we are actually assuming some associated delivery expenses. We have 10, and then we also have about 70 in operating expenses. So the company is earning around a 20% operating margin as this product or service is getting delivered each month. Now on the balance sheet, the accounts receivable will stay at 400, but then fall to zero by the end of month two, because that's when the collection takes place. And then the deferred revenue will decrease by 100 each month. So you can see it right here that the AR stays in this range for the first two months, but then sometime between the end of month one and the end of month two, it goes to zero because the cash collection takes place. The deferred revenue, meanwhile, starts at 400 and then just decreases each month as the 100 in revenue is recognized. Now, the treatment of the cash here is a little bit counterintuitive because if you look at what actually happens, in months where there is revenue recognition, the cash balance actually falls. But going from month one to month two, the cash balance actually increases because that was when the AR collection takes place. The customer finally pays us, we get this 400 in cash. And so this goes up, but it doesn't go up by 400 because we also have expenses associated with this. We have the COGS, we have the operating expenses, and we have the income taxes. So it's a little bit counterintuitive, but that's how you can think about it. For a situation like this, the cash will decrease as the revenue is being recognized from a deferred revenue increase. But then when the cash is actually collected, you will get a temporary bump in cash when it goes up. And then after that, it will start decreasing once again. And you can see all the entries on the cash list statement right here. So that's about it. I just wanted to make this a shorter video covering a very specific topic that will hopefully help you out in both interviews and on the job. We started by explaining the basic concept of deferred revenue, and I showed you that matrix for the different types of working capital line items. With delivery expenses, it's really not too complicated. It's still the same basic setup right here. It's just that in this case, instead of just recognizing revenue, you also recognize expenses. So you say that the cost of services or cost of goods sold increases by 200, and so your pre-tax income and net income are all lower if there are associated delivery expenses. Deferred revenue is a liability because it represents a future obligation or a future cash outflow because of those delivery expenses or because of simple corporate taxes or a combination of both. In SaaS accounting, the main thing to be careful of is that even if customers pay upfront for a contract when it's first signed, the company's not gonna collect that cash right away in most cases. It might take them 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. And in those cases, you will get an entry for accounts receivable that offsets the deferred revenue as the cash is collected, the AR will go back to zero or 
It'll gradually decrease to zero as the cash is being collected. And then the deferred revenue will also decrease over time as the revenue is recognized. So that's it for this lesson. Hopefully now you know a little bit more about deferred revenue, or at least you've gotten a quick review of the subject if you already know something about this.